I'd like to now do a short introduction to uh, tonight's speaker, Sir Tom Farmer. Uh, I hope Sir Tom Farmer is reasonably well known to most of you. He's probably his main claim to fame is in starting QuickFit uh, back in the early 1970s, uh, a business he then sold to Ford for a reasonable sum of money. Uh, he has been knighted by Her Majesty the Queen and by the Vatican. He has a list of awards that is slightly longer than the time we have to actually uh, go through tonight since we actually do want to get uh, to the talk. And I know Sir Tom has a, a deadline to get out uh, after this. Uh, he's also uh, received a whole bunch of awards for his uh, philanthropic uh, kind of activities. But one of the key things, and one of the key things that he's here for, is he's probably built more value in businesses than most people have in the local environment, which is one of the reasons we're really pleased that he's taking the time tonight to come and go through some piece of his story. So rather than me rabbiting on all night, I'd like to hand over to Sir Tom Farmer. Tom. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Can I just say that it's on occasions like this that uh, I wish that uh, some of my old teachers were available. Uh, school for me was a nightmare. I didn't like school. I left when I was 14 years of age, uh, just going on 15. And I remember the, in the last couple of months, I got into a bit of trouble and the head teacher called me up to his office and he said to me, tell me, farmer, what do you hope to get out of your education? I said, well, it'd be quite nice if I got a certificate. And he looked at me and said, get a certificate, farmer. He says, I'll guarantee you one thing, you'll get two certificates. I said, that's very nice. He says, yes. He says, your birth certificate and your death certificate. <laughs> that's all you'll get. So I do wish he was here now. And I also wish my mum was here about as well. The, uh, I was the youngest of seven children. I was brought up in Leith. And all my brothers and sisters seemed to do rather well as far as academic qualifications were concerned. And I had one dream was that I would end up going to university. It'd be quite nice to be able to go home and say, hey, mum, do you know where I was tonight? I was actually giving a talk in the university. She'd be so impressed in every way. The, uh, I was asked to give just a brief outline of my own business career, the uh, things that have happened to me and uh, things that have not happened to me because of various reasons. Uh, and what I would like to start off in is just to give you my view about where we are in the world of business at the present moment and then touch on my own development and how things happen. Over the last few years, all we seem to have heard about, and it is about the last few years, is in business has always been negative. Everything we hear about business just now is negative. Recession, unemployment, bankruptcy, etc. And it's been tough, and it's been tough for the last few years, and the future doesn't seem very bright. I'm a great realist. We have no point in burying our head in the sand, and we must always, all of us, live in the real world. But one thing is, in the real world, we will eventually come out of the tunnel. We will come out into the bright sunshine. And I'm not sure yet how far the tunnel is going to last. It seems to go longer and longer as each day goes by or you listen to the Chancellor on the radio or watch them on television. But one thing I'm quite sure about, whilst the light may be keep moving away from us, there's one thing we must do. All of us who are in business or thinking about going into business, we must always be ready. And there'll be those people, I believe, and I know from experience, who have looked after the people that make up the teams of their organisation, whether it be small teams or large teams, and be those people who have invested quite simply in their people who will be the most ready for when the opportunities come along. I, uh, you may be interested to know, I contacted the organisers of this event tonight, and I did ask who would all be in the audience so that I could get some idea who I would talk to. And I thought you might like, just like a description of what was given about yourselves. I was told quite simply that there'd be people from the financial world, accountants, training people, there'd be a number of directors, people with political affiliation, business consultants, students, lecturers, and the best of the lot, a few normal people. <laughs> I don't know where you fit in, ladies and gentlemen, but I definitely know where I would like to fit in. But seriously, I'd like to think why, and I ask the question, why are we all here tonight? What it is that we'd like to achieve, or what we'd like to find out? And I'd hope that we're all here with one aim, and that is that we're all committed to succeed and whatever we choose to do, whether in business or in personal life. And the most important message that I can give as a guarantee of success that I've ever led is to ensure that our people, the people in our organizations, our colleagues in business, 
are better trained and more highly self-motivated, and I stress the word self-motivated, than ever before, than definitely anyone who may be a competitor. I started the very first business I had in 1964, only yards from this building at the corner of Buclew Street and Buclew Place. And I remember it wasn't long started when somebody gave me an article by a man called Paul Getty, one of the greatest entrepreneurs the world has ever seen. And the article was headed, How to Succeed in Business. And Paul Getty said that all you had to do was three things, rise early, work late, and strike oil. <laughs> Simple as that. Well, a boy coming from Leith in a little corner shop in Buclew Street selling tires at discount prices, I knew I could rise early, I knew I could work late, but I never thought I could ever, ever strike oil. And for me, of course, the oil, the oil was the round black products, five of them on everybody's car, and the long piece of shiny metal called the exhaust pipe. That was, for me, was my oil. Those who lecture on business devote much time in talking in the business world in their lectures about TQM, total quality management. And they keep stressing that we must all achieve in the business world total quality management. And it seems very easy the way they talk about it. Maybe all you've got to do is to go out and buy the latest book or employ one of the new specialists that have set up to advise you or just join a meeting like tonight and all will be unfolded to you. And you get told other things you've got to do. You've got to go for BS 5750 or ISO 9000, etc. And these are the answers to all of our problems. Just document everything and it will all happen without you having to do anything. TQM programs is another fashionable expression. Just go and listen, as I said earlier, to somebody like myself speaking, and it all gets unfolded, how you can turn your business, small or large, into a very successful venture. Train people, they say. Just train people, train people, and all will work out for you. But one thing we should also always remember, that we can train monkeys to do many jobs. And for the human being, you've got to do more than just train. You've also got to make sure that they're educated and understand what's in the benefit for them if they do the proper job. In business, in the world that we live in today, there are many, many investments we make. We make in business investments in property, in computers, etc., and marketing programs. And whilst they all help us to improve the efficiency of our organization, they cannot help to us to develop what I call the winning culture and create a can-do attitude that's necessary in any business that's set out to succeed whether it be large or small. You must have that winning culture and you must have throughout the organization a can-do attitude. You know, if we think about our businesses today, we buy machines for our business today. They all come with the most fantastic set of instructions, whether it's a computer, whether it's a camera, but whatever it is, any piece of equipment we buy for our, our businesses, whether it be large or small, come from uh, with fantastic instructions. And provided we take the time and trouble to read that, then we will get maximum performance. But for the most intricate, the most difficult, the most expensive piece of equipment that anyone in any business, and I stress large or small, that they'll ever have, for the people in our business, there is no set of instructions. And all too often, those of us responsible for leading and managing our businesses make too little effort to really find out what makes that piece of equipment really operate and how we can make them operate better. Victor Hugo, he said once that there was nothing like a dream to create the future. Well, that's only partly right. Leonardo da Vinci or Jules Verne, they all had dreams, fantastic dreams. But their dreams sometimes never turned into reality because, quite simply, they lacked the proper tools. And the most important tool that I have found in developing and growing a number of businesses is we must have the tool, the team of highly, and I stress, self-motivated people. For me, quite simply, in growing and developing a successful business, it's not about achieving total quality management. Because if we ever think that we've achieved total quality management in our businesses, then the day we start going backwards. The target should be not TQM, but I would say BQM, better quality management. Better quality management programs mean that we recognize every day that we are looking for better ways to do better business, resulting in better profits and better quality for our people and most importantly, for our customers. So how did it all happen for me? Why is it I stand here tonight and have this pleasure of telling you the story? Well, as I tell you the story about my own development, if I sound boastful in any way, I do not apologize. 
because I'm tremendously proud of it, the same as the 12,500 people that made up our team. So eventually an organization that operated in 18 different countries throughout the world. The story starts in Leith, the capital of Edinburgh. I was the youngest of seven children and had a great, fantastic upbringing. And often when we were asked, and my brothers and sisters and other people who were brought up with us, what do we think about that community? What do we remember about being brought up in Leith? It's a feeling of tremendous security. Knowing at the end of the day, we were surrounded by people who cared and shared. And that seems to have been my good fortune all my life. I've been surrounded by people that I could rely on. And hopefully at the end of the day, they could rely on me. School for me, as I said earlier, was not an exciting adventure. And I left school. And I'm very fortunate, the first job I ever went into was a stores boy in a tire company. The, uh, the tire company operated in Gayfield Square in Edinburgh. And I joined an organization that I had no control over. I must have done something to get the job. The, uh, but once I joined them, I had no control over And I was very fortunate the organization was managed by two wonderful gentlemen, Tommy Blaine and Jack Stewart. And they knew exactly how to get the best out of young people, how to get the best out of their team. They always set you challenges. You knew at the end of the day you could achieve the challenge provided you did your best. But if you didn't do your best, then they would tell you what they thought about you and you did your best the next time. If you did do your best, there was a reward in it. And often that reward was no, nothing else but other than recognition of a good job done. But there was also always a carrot. And the carrot for a young lad like me was, pass your driving test and you'll get a job driving the van. Well, at 18 years of age, I passed my driving test and I got a job in driving the van. And the first day that I had to go and take on the van job, they called me into the office and they said to me, well, Tom, tell me quite simply, what's your new job? How do you see it? And I said, Mr. Blaine, I'm going to be the best van driver this organization's ever had. He says, no, you're not. And I said, I am. I'm going to be the best. He says, he's not. He says, you're not a van driver. I said, I'm a van driver. Remember, I was 18 years of age. And the attraction about getting that van was you got the opportunity to take the van home at night. And nobody in our street or where I live had any vehicle at all. And I only could only think of Friday night going to the dancing and being the only boy in the dancing to say to the girl, can I drive you home? The big attraction, that van. And I, they said, you're not going to be a van driver. I was devastated. And I said, but you promised me that if I passed my test and I struck it, then you would get a job as a van driver. They said, no, we didn't. What we told you, and we were very careful about what we said, we said you would get the job of driving the van. And there's a difference from being a van driver and driving the van. We want you to realize now, Tom, that as you leave here this morning, that you are not a van driver, you are a company representative. And you go out there with our van, with our name on it, you will meet customers who have never been into the organization. Their only contact is you or the sales rep or someone on the telephone. And it's how you behave, how you portray yourself, how people have a view of the organization. And that was something that stuck with me. They, 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 there was a technique that they, they did something. They made me feel important. And the next day I came in and I had this jacket and a tie on because I definitely was now no longer a van driver. I was a company representative. I even went to the cheek of going to the equivalent of Toronto Print and having some business cars printed. Life for me worked very well. I went from being driving the van to becoming a sales rep. And one day the, uh, I was approached by an organization who asked if I would join them. I joined them. The, the big attraction was I got a better car than the one that I had. And that lasted for three years. And at the age of 23, the, uh, the company I was working with was taken over by a large American organization. And everything changed. And what was a comfortable organization, a good organization, it became you were just a number. And things, the process was more important than doing an actual good job. Achieving the budget was more important than achieving high sales because this organization set lower budgets to make sure everybody could achieve them in every way. The, uh, well, things didn't work out for me and I fell out with the people. I fell out over a very simple thing. I fell out over money. I believe you see quite simply, in those days, and I believe it now, that people work for money. I believe that. And if anybody knows anybody in the MD in this room is looking for a job where they're not looking to get paid, call me tomorrow morning. <laughs> I've got jobs for you all. But money isn't the be-all and end-all of everything. 
Money is important. We need a decent salary. We need a proper salary. We need properly rewarded for doing a job, a good job. The, uh, but we also need to have the satisfaction of knowing that we're cre creating something more than just working for money. And if it was only money, we'd all be out in the oil rigs. And I believe at the end of the day, the, a lot of that part is a trust. What helps people to make a better job is a trust that they have in the organisation and they don't want to let the organisation down. Well, I felt the organisation let me down and I left that organisation at the age of 23 and I was walking down the street, just the Buclew Street, the one day and the shop on the corner of Buclew Street, Buclew Place, was becoming empty. It was a grocery shop, a looted shop and at that time in 1964, it was illegal to give discounts for any products. People like Phillips and Hoover and all these other organisations could stipulate what price you had to sell their product. And if you sold at discount prices, they could take you to court, the goods could be confiscated, and they could be fined rather heavily. But it was just about to change. There was a new law going through Parliament called retail price maintenance. And that was going to, retail prices were going to be abolished. And people had started to operate businesses where they were given discounts and the knowledge at the end of the day, if they were taken to court, that the court case would, down, would go in their favour. Well, I decided that I would like to start a tyre business, dealing direct with the customers. And one of the tyre companies gave me 100 tyres on sale of return. I had a good reputation. I had a reputation as a young lad who worked hard and did a good job. The, uh, and life was very pleasant. I painted the shop blue and yellow. And the reason I pointed it blue and yellow because that was the cheapest colours I could buy in that one day. And that, that, that colour scheme followed me throughout the rest of my career. Everything was blue and yellow. And life was very pleasant. I had one ambition. That was to earn £15 a week profit. £5 for the rent, £5 to pay my mum the housekeeping money, and £5 to go out on a Friday and Saturday night. Well, I did all right, because I went out most Friday and Saturday nights. And then life changed all of a sudden for me by one simple thing, a phone call. The phone rang, and a voice came on and said, Hello, is that Tom Farmer? I said, yes. She said, my name's Jimmy Johnson from the Sunday Post. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Sunday Post, the Sunday Post is the next most important piece of print in any household in Scotland, apart from the Bible. And if the Sunday Post says it, or they did in the past, if they said a story that the Martians had landed on the Isle of Barra, then five million people believed that. Because it's, and they say, he was telling me that he was going to write an article about people who were given discounts the, uh, in this new world that we lived in. The, uh, and how was it that I was given discounts and how did I manage to get my supplies and my tyres? Well, I exaggerate slightly. I don't mind admitting it. And I told him about the fact that when I finished at night at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in that shop in Buglew Street, that I'd get into my van and I'd drive down to the Midlands in England and I'd meet up with people in dark laybys so as nobody could see us. And I would buy my tyres, have to pay cash for them, load up the van, come back at night the, and start all over again the uh, six or seven o'clock in the morning when I opened up the shop. That's terrible, Tom. You shouldn't be allowed that. He says, these big boys, I says, they are. They're only trying to put me out of business. And all I'm trying to do is bring the price of motoring. Remember, this is 1964. I'm going to bring the price of motoring down for the public in Edinburgh. He says, it shouldn't be allowed. Well, I didn't think too much about it until three weeks afterwards. My dad came in on a Sunday morning. I used to always go to half past nine mass and leave. I started to court my, my wife then at that time. We met up at half past nine and I'd be... After mass, we'd go for a coffee, and I'd come up to the cruise street at 11 o'clock, half past 11, and open up. Well, my dad came into the bedroom, and he said, what the hell have you been up to? And then on the front page of the Sunday Post, it said, Tire King Tommy, squeezed out by the big boys. <laughs> well, I managed to duck out under his arm, into the van, off I went. That Sunday, I came up, and I drove up the street here, and I turned the corner, and 42 cars were waiting outside, and they'd come from all over. And it never stopped from that moment on. Now, you often hear at the end of the day that you've got to work 24 hours, seven days a week. Well, that's impossible. But you can work some hell of a long hours. And there was only me. There was only me, and I couldn't do anything. And there was a man in one of the tenement buildings looking at me. And he was leaning out, and he said to me, Tommy, you're a bit busy today, aren't you? You've got to remember, I was only saw one or two customers a day in the past. And I said, yeah, he said, I'll come down to help me. And he came down to help me. And what we did was we got the cars, the ones that I had tyres for, and the customers to jack up their own cars, to take the wheels off and bring them into the shop and put them back on again. It was a wee bit like DIY. And they enjoyed it, you know. 
It's amazing what you could get the customers. You can't get them to do that today, right? But it's amazing what you could get them to do. And I had to employ people. I needed need to get people to help me. And I did, never employed them. They didn't know what to do. So I got my pals, my pals from the street, from the boys that had been in the tire companies with me, the uh, lads that had been in school with me. And we developed a wee team, a team of about seven guys working out that shop. And it was an incredible team. The, uh, we all had one ambition. That was to enjoy what we did. And we loved it. And we worked the hours. We played together. We stayed together. We met our girlfriends together. We got married around about the same time. And if you look at that, the original children, the first children that we had, they always seemed to come around about September. Because uh, we only ever took one day a year off. <laughs> and that was Christmas Day. The, uh, life was very pleasant. Then it changed again. It changed again. By this time, we had opened up in 1967, 68. We had opened up five shops, the five places. And the phone rang again, and a voice came on, and a man said, Hello, is that Tom Farmer? And I said, Yes. He said, My name's Alex Denson. He says, I'm from a tire company called Albany Tires. He says, I'd like to come and see you with, your, with my partner. I said, Certainly. I said, You want to? I thought they were going to come and sell me tires. Well, I had a shop in an office in Murrayfield, just at Roseburn. And they came. But on a Sunday, a couple of Sundays before they were coming, I happened to go up to visit my father. And he was reading the Sunday Times. And there was an article about these two gentlemen called Andrew Knight and Alex Denson, who had started a tire company in Albany called Albany Tires in London. They had 17 places and they were looking to expand. I said, Andrew, they come coming to see me. I couldn't believe it. I'd never met anyone who had been written about in the Sunday Times. I was most impressed. I was quite excited. So I decided I had to set up an office. I had to do something to impress them. I got the yellow paint, I painted the shop, and they came in to see me. I got an old desk, a bit of carpet from my mum, and we set up a very nice office. Well, they came, and quite simply, they said, without hesitation, that the reason they'd come was they wanted to buy the business. And they'd heard about me and the team of guys that we had, how well we'd done, they were looking to expand, they wanted to expand in Scotland, and the intention was to go through the stock exchange in a couple of months' time. And would I be interested? And the answer to that was, I wasn't interested. And they said, well, you would be, surely at the end of the day, if the price was right. And I said, well, maybe if the price was right. And they said, well, what price would be right? Well, I had no idea. But I did remember my father doing his football pools. And he used to tell us when we were young that one day Uncle Littlewoods would come along with 75,000 pounds. And that's what he'd be won. And it seemed an awful lot of money. It would be five pounds for each of the seven children, five pounds for the church to help pay off their debt, Five pounds to buy a house in Christophan with hot water and a bath, and the rest would provide the pension for my mum and dad. So I said to them, Well, I suppose if I've got 75,000, I'd be quite happy. I said, 75,000? Well, let's think about it. So as we were going out, they, and they were going back to London, they said, Can we have a look about your premises? And I had a warehouse next door, and the warehouse was about the size of this room, and it was just filled with tyres. That was all it did. All we ever did with the money that we made was buy more and more and more tyres. We counted our profit in the amount of tyres we had. And we started off with 2,800 tyres at the beginning of the month, and we ended up with 3,100. The difference was our profit. The uh, simple, simple way that we ran the business. The, uh, and they came up and they said, can we see around your warehouse? And the warehouse had double doors, and I opened the double doors, the, uh, and they stood, and they, they couldn't believe it. They looked at the tyres, the, the and one of them was smoking a cigar, Andrew Knight. He was a tall man. And they said, Oh, blimey, Tom, what do you do with all these tyres? I thought, what a stupid question. Uh, uh, I said, I says, we sell them. We sell them, yeah. He says, no, no, I don't mean that. He says, and I swear blind to you, ladies and gentlemen, exactly how it went. He says, no, no, I don't just mean that. He says, how often do you turn your stock over? I said, turn the stock over. If you think we've got time to go around this warehouse, taking the stock from the bottom and turning it up to the top, the, uh, and I don't know how you work. No, no, he says. I mean, how often do you sell your stock? I said, Mr. Knight, we only sell our stock once. <laughs> well, they looked at me. They got in the taxi and they went to the airport and I thought that's the last I'll ever hear then. A couple of days later, they phoned me up and they said, listen, we'd like to come back and see you. But this time, could you arrange to have your financial advisor with you? They uh, would like to really take on this, the conversation a bit further. The, uh, well, the conversation went a bit further and eventually I joined up with them. I uh, sold the business for a fantastic amount of money in those days, £400,000. And I took stock the, uh, and I took a bit of cash. And I joined up with two of the most wonderful people 
that I've ever met in my life. They were amazing mentors for a young person like me to grow and develop in a business. And they taught me very basic things. At the end of the day, the most important thing that they taught me was the important elements in our business. And they said quite simply, and they, they would talk to institutions, to banks, no matter where they went, they told the same story. The most important person in the organization was the people within the organization. The staff, the employees, the people that made up the company. The second most important people, they said, were the suppliers. Whether they be the suppliers of advertising, or whether they be suppliers of tires or car accessories, or whatever it was, or the bank, whatever it was. Because without these people there to give you support in their products, you couldn't have a business. So you had to have a highly self-motivated, and that's where I got that expression in the lesson about self-motivated teams of people. And you had to have the relationship with suppliers so you were the best customer they had. And if you did the number one right, number two right, then you had something to give number three. And number three, of course, was the customer. And it wasn't a case of the customer came third. It was just the line that was required. Concentrate on your people, they said. Concentrate on building up relationships with your suppliers. Big suppliers or small suppliers. And then you've got the ingredients, the products, to look after the customer. And the third important, the fourth important person, they said, was the investors. And the investors never liked that. The pension funds hated to hear that. They wanted to claim that they were number one. But when you explain to them, if you didn't get number one right, number two right, and number three right, then there was no profit for number four, which they were. It was amazing how they changed. And they were quite happy to be number four. Well, that life was very pleasant. And it changed again in 1968, 69, the year when we merged with a large company called Brown Brothers. And then a year later, we were approached by an American company called the Dana Corporation, and we sold that business. I stayed with them for a few months and I found out I didn't enjoy it. So I went home one night and I said to Anne, Anne, you know, by this time we were married, we had two young children. I said, I've been working out many years I've, I've worked. I said, now I reckon that I'm due for graduation. They were the amount of hours I put in. And she says, what do you mean? I said, I'm going to pack up all together. She says, what we do? I said, we're going to live in America for a while. Well, I tell you, we did that. We went to live in America. It was fantastic, wonderful experience. If anybody in this room starts a business and they become 28 years of age and they think of doing something, sell up and go and live in America. It is a fantastic experience. It lasted four months. The, uh, one night, Anne said to me, we'll go out for dinner tomorrow night. Well, we went out for dinner and she, she ran across the table. She took my hand, she looked me in the eye and she said, darling, I love you. I thought it was rather nice. <laughs> she never really said that, not in a, not in a restaurant, you know. They, uh, this was in just outside San Francisco. She says, but there's something I've got to tell you. She says, and she started to shake. And the table started to shake. She says, you know, when we got married, we got married for three things, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, for sickness and health. She says, a lot better than I ever thought it would be. She says, richer, for poorer, things have worked out well for us, and sickness and health. She says, we're blessed with good health at all times. She says, but one thing I never married you for. I said, what was that, darling? She says, I never married you to live with you seven days a week, 24 hours a day. She says, you're driving me crazy. And if you don't do something about it, she says, we'll end up as one of these statistics. They, uh, I said, well, what would you like to do? She says, I'll leave it to you. I says, let's go home. So we went home. We came home a couple of weeks later. They, uh, and I was home for about four nights and I'd contacted all the lads who were in that first business. The original team of about 12 of us, like the apostles or the band of brothers. And we met up with a pub in Christophan Road in Edinburgh. And one of the finest compliments was ever paid to me was paid to me that night. But after we had ordered the beer, one of the lads turned around to me and said, Tom, are you home for good? And I said, yep, I'm home for good. They said, well, I'll tell you what, what are we going to do now? And I'd seen, I'd seen the startup of businesses breaking up, people specializing. I'd seen the startup, McDonald's was just starting in the early 1970s in America. Kentucky Chai Fried Chicken. And in my own business, the automotive parts business, the automotive repair business, there was people specializing in just fitting engine, just doing brakes, just doing mufflers or exhaust systems. The, uh, and I said, let's go into the exhaust business. Well, I tell you, they said, fine, whatever you think. So we opened up the very first quick fit shop in 1971. I'm often asked, how did you ever arrive and come up with the name quick fit? How much did you pay Satchis and Satchis or some wonderful organization? Well, what happened was quite simple. A few days after being home and having met with the boys, I developed a bad dose of the flu and I was in the house for 10 days and I had nothing to do. And I was thinking about this new business we were starting. And I was trying to think of a name and I wanted to have a quick service, 
something unusual, something different. Because at that time, if you took your car anywhere, you had to leave it for three days to get the job done. And we just wanted to be, offer a service that you could drive in and get it done while you waited. The, and when I was 14 years of age, I had a small business going out at night. And I used to go out cleaning cookers. The, I'd, I'd known them. My mum didn't like to clean the cooker at home. My sisters didn't like to clean the cookers. And they paid their brothers to do it. So I thought there might be other people that would be willing to pay me to clean it. I used to put an advert in the paper. Cookers cleaned as new. K-O-O-K-E-R-S. And clean was K-L-E-E-N-E-D. As new, N-U. And I was coming up with the name Quick Service. Q-U-I-C-K. S-E-R-B-I-C. And I remember the cookers cleaned as new. So I changed the quick to K-W-I-K hyphen F-I-T. And that brand name became worth millions and millions and millions of pounds. We didn't pay Saatchi. We just used our own initiative. I came up with a name which was unbelievable. Lay in every way. Well, we started Quickfit in 1971. And the story of Quickfit has been well documented. It's been written about, it's been studied, it's been studied in Harvard Business School, etc. It was an incredible organisation. And people will sometimes say to me, what made your company different? Well, I'll tell you what made our company different. We were the same as any other people in the automotive repair business. Our Michelin tyres were the same as other people's Michelin tyres. Our Goodyear tyres were the same. Our prices were competitive, not always the cheapest. But we did two things. We were obsessed with the customer and trying to give the best job we did, we could possibly do. And we were obsessed with looking after our people. And as a result, our people were the best people in the organisation, in, in the, the company. Our company people were better than any of our competitors. And that's where we had the edge. We made sure that our people were highly self-motivated in every way. I referred earlier on about the need to be successful in business and what we had to do, and about giving quality and looking after the customers. And for as far as the future is concerned, in the new business world that we're going to enter, because the world that we're living in today is going to change dramatically. Make no mistake about it. For all the economic crisis and all the difficulties, there is new things going to happen in the next 20 years. And we've never made sure that we're ready to do that. And it'll be the way in the future, and the way that we organise our businesses, a new approach for the new business world. The way we listen to our customers, and more intensely than ever before. Whether we're a small company or a big, a big company, we must listen more and more. What is it our customers want? We have fallen through the trap over the years, thinking we knew that we could dictate what the customer wanted. Well, we learned much to our, our usual cost that that wasn't right. We had to listen to what the customer wanted. That would be so important. And I believe, quite simply, it's the way we mobilise our people at a higher degree than ever before to increase the self-motivation and realize their own creativity. The people within our organization know more about what we should do often than the people who are responsible for leading and managing the organization. We must listen to it. And I remember one time when the organization of Quickfoot had grown to quite a certain size and we had about two, almost 2,000 places. The, uh, the, there was a, sh a store next to our office in Murrayfield. And Alan Patterson, who's the manager there, stopped me one day when I was coming out of the car. I says, Tom, he says, you know, some of our boys would like to get with you. We, we seem to be missing out. We, we never get a chance to talk to you. It seems to be so busy. Could we meet up with you one day? And I said, sure. When would you like to do it? They said, next Sunday afternoon. Sunday afternoon was my day off. They, they did that on purpose. I thought, you're so-and-so. So right here. And we met up on Sunday afternoon. We met up in the office, a very nice office that we had, with a nice meeting room, a nice boardroom and everything. And these lads came in, seven of these boys, and they sat around the table. And I said, what can I do for you? They said, can we be very frank? I said, certainly. Of course you can be very frank, as long as you don't want to lose your jobs. They, uh, but they knew what the message was. They, uh, but they said, we and, and I said, they said, we have a problem. And they said, what's the problem? And they said, you. You and the people who are responsible for managing the business. Now, we were the best operators that MB had. And we knew that and we believed that. And these guys went on to tell us that we had forgotten what it was all about to run a quick fit centre. Plus, we had done that. They acknowledged that. But things had changed since the times when we had done it. We were more demanding on our people than ever before. We would computerised the business. We were more efficiency. We were more key on stock control and various other things than we'd ever before. And they said, all we want to do is we want to do what you've preached day in and day out, look after the customer. And now we're becoming administrators and having to do other things. And you, as I said, as they said earlier on, the, uh, you, they said to me, have forgotten what it's all about. And ladies and gentlemen, without doubt, it's listening to our people within our organisations and listening to the people outside of organisations 
that will definitely help us to create better businesses. To achieve real, real quality in our businesses, we have to change often our habits and improve and strengthen the culture that we have. We have to meet or exceed the expectations of everybody who's associated with the organisation. Better quality management, not TQM, but better quality management is not simply a matter of creating a quality department or reading a book or going to a lecture or putting somebody in charge and making them responsible for quality. Changing and developing a company's culture means changing and developing people's behaviour and their, their attitudes, not just installing new machineries or some new procedure. The economy that we live in today, we have to believe in it. We have to be positive. Let's not be negative. Don't suffer from stinking thinking. It won't always be like this. We will definitely come out of the tunnel. And we should also look back. Let's learn from history. The previous generations, every generation, our parents, our grandparents, and their parents all had difficult times, whether it be recession or whether it be wars or wherever it was. But we always came out. And I believe quite simply we will come out. And one of the reasons I believe that we'll come out stronger than ever before is because I have great faith in the young generation of the country. I believe that the younger generation of this, in this world at the present moment, and especially in this country, are better educated, and most importantly of all, more caring about social injustice than ever before. And these people, because I have faith in them, will make a difference. It will come out. It will, we will make an improvement. We must make ready and make sure that we're ready to take the improvements and the opportunities that come along. And I'll just finish by making two points. And if you don't remember anything that I've said tonight, I'd ask you to try and remember these two points that I'm going to give you. Firstly, the word entrepreneurship is fashionable. It's a fashionable word. You know, what has become fashionable? Partnership, quality, whatever it is. They become flavor of the month or flavor of the year. An entrepreneur is very, very fashionable and has been for a period of time. When I first heard that used to describe me, Tom Farmer, as an entrepreneur, I sometimes wondered what it actually meant. I didn't know whether it was a compliment or whether there was some negative connotation to it. And I used to go and ask people, what's your vision of an entrepreneur? Or I read a dictionary and I found out quite, quite simply that reading the dictionary, the thicker the dictionary, the more money you paid for it, the more reasons or, or explanations of the word the entrepreneur. So I gave up doing that and I decided that I would set out my own definition. And for me, quite simply, an entrepreneur is someone who sees an opportunity and is able to reach out and grasp it for their own benefit, for the benefit of their family, for their business, and most importantly of all, if it applied today, it definitely will apply even more so in the future for the benefit of the community in which they operate. Let me say once again, ladies and gentlemen, for me, an entrepreneur is someone who sees an opportunity, sees an opportunity, reaches out and grasps it for their own benefit, for the benefit of their family, their businesses, and most importantly of all, for the benefit of the community. Now, we should also realize and recognize that not everyone has a desire to go out and start their own business. That just doesn't happen. Everybody doesn't do it. And I'm glad that everybody didn't want to start up in the tire and exhaust business. It would have been a bit overcrowded in every way. However, what we want to do in the organisations, what we want to do in places like the universities at the present moment, is we want to encourage and develop amongst our people the can-do entrepreneurial attitude. It's not just in the business world that we need people with vision and energy, but every sector of life, every sector, whether it be the National Health Service, the government, or wherever else it is, are looking for entrepreneurs, people who are willing to reach out and grasp opportunities out with the organisation or within an organisation. We need the desired spirit the, in health service, education, the civil service and public services. But enterprise, uh, entrepreneurship, let me just stress to you, is not just about starting your own business. If you consider that you want to start your own business, then go out and do it. Don't hesitate. Don't ever get into the stage where 10 years from now or 20 years from now, you say, I wish I had. Because if you go out and start, and if it doesn't work, it may not work, then so what? What a lesson you'll have learned, and you'll be much better the second time. Let me assure you, ladies and gentlemen, don't hesitate, because you'll be the loser. Provided you must do two things. 
make sure you do your research and you have adequate finance and are able to do the job. And the second point I would make is about the future. What's going to happen to us in the future? Well, I don't know. But the governor of the Bank of England says he can't forecast what's going to happen tomorrow. Why should I be able to forecast what's going to happen? Definitely not. And I don't think about it too much. The, I just want to make sure that I'm ready today to take the opportunities to come along. But I, th there's a singer who's just brought out a new CD. And that singer was top of, the top, the top of the charts when I was a boy. And it's a girl called, a lady now called Doris Day. She's in her 80s and she's just launched a new CD. And she was a type of American girl, good, clean, all American girl that every mother wished her boy would bring home. And she had a top hit, the record. And it was Que Sera, Sera. And it went, Que Sera, Sera. Forever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Que Sera, Sera. And that became top, the top 20. Que Sera, Sera. What will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Ladies and gentlemen, just think of those words. Just dwell on them. Well, I think they're a load of rubbish. <laughs> what will be, will be. I don't believe what will be, will be. I believe quite simply what will be is what we work to try to make it to be. We can, we can dictate what's going to happen in the future, provided we make sure that we're ready and willing to do something about it. And it's not just, just it's quite simply about living in a dream or, or, living a, or kidding ourselves on. For me, quite simply, we can do things today that will make a difference for ourselves and our families in the future. So if you ever hear anyone in the future say to you, que sera, sera, just say to them quite simply, that's rubbish. <laughs> what will be will what I make it to be. And we should make sure we always remember that. Ladies and gentlemen, business is all about people. You may not have learned a lot tonight, but I've told you what's driven me. I've told you at the end of the day the, uh, how much I've enjoyed business in every way. And I've told you, i tried to tell you at the end of the day what I believe is important. I believe that business is all about people. People need to be looked after. People need to feel that they belong. And people need to be listened to. Thanks very much for listening to me. And good luck, good health. God bless you all. Thanks very much, Tom. I, I know you're on a slightly tight deadline, but we've probably got time for two or three questions if there are some from the floor. Nice next time to me. I'm going to the opening of the portrait gallery. <laughs> I've already seen it, actually. But. So you should go when it opens up on Thursday. Sir Tom, it's uh, Gordon Cairns. I don't know if you recognise me, but uh, 28 years ago I came to see you in uh, the Quick Fit uh, head office in Kerstorfen. And at that stage I was 28. I didn't go to America, but I joined uh, the Laidlaw Group as finance director. And I thought I was going to come in to see you for about 20 minutes, and you actually spent about four hours with me. And I learned more during that time, I have to say, than my law degree at Edinburgh University and my CA with what is now KPMG. And I think, part of, I know that I'm not asking you a question at this time, but I think I want to make a statement to back up who you really are and that you are very genuine, very authentic. I think one of the greatest legacies that you uh, created in, in QuickFit was that you took young guys, possibly weren't good at school, and you gave them self-respect, self-confidence, and self-esteem. And it was always a pleasure, even when you were parting, com parting with money at QuickFit, to actually uh, be served by those people. I'm now a headhunter. The most impressive executive that uh, I have interviewed in 11 years is Tony Lochry, who was your group managing director, and I'm sure that Tony uh, learned a lot from you as well. Now I'll get to my question, which is, I think Scotland's in a really bad state. I'm like you, I think there will come a turning point. But if you were First Minister of Scotland, what one thing would you do to turn things around? Can I just make a point? I got rather excited when you said you're a headhunter. I thought you were going to offer me a job. <laughs> the, uh, I thought, oh, last, a new career. What would I do if I was First Minister? Well, first of all, he's got unbelievable surrounded by people who are there to give him advice. The uh, people who are a lot more, more capable than I am. But there's one thing I would definitely do, and I'd concentrate on. I'd concentrate on the hundreds of thousands of young people who have not got a job. I don't care what it takes, what it gives, the, uh, or what we have to give up. We've got to make sure that somehow or other these young people are given jobs. 
And, you know, it's too often people think that the young people don't want to work. Well, that's just a load of rubbish. 90% of them want a job, and they're desperate for a job. And if we have to bring in legislation, we have to make it compulsory to employ young people, then we can do it. How many organisations that are employing 200 people couldn't take in another two young people and give them a job and give them training? One of the strengths of QuickFit was the, uh, that we, we took people at the age of 16 and we put them through our own training courses. And these young people became so loyal to the organisation. They, they, they did what I did in that first tyre company I told you a story about with Tommy Blaine and Jack Stewart. The, uh, the, the job, the company was an important part of their life. And eventually about 80% of the young people who stuck with us eventually became managers running our centres. And you couldn't build a better and more loyal team of people whom they you brought through from 16 years of age. So that's what I would do. I'd make sure at the end of the day, no matter what it took, that these young people, because if we don't do that, as the papers say day in and day out, and I don't put a lot of faith in our media, but there's some things, some things and some comments they make, we'll lose a generation. And we cannot afford to lose a generation. We need them. Any more questions? You know, if, if I'm telling the story and I, I talk about it, I don't want you to think in any way that I believe that everything was right in our organisation. It wasn't right. We, we, we made a lot of mistakes. We made more mistakes than we had successes. But just so happened the successes were bigger than the mistakes. Most of them were small and we were able to sort them very quickly. The, uh, but we did, do, we did do a lot of things right and we did a lot of things wrong. The, uh, but the real key was, and the difference was, we were quick to recognise when it was wrong and do something about it. We didn't allow it to feed through the organization like a cancer. Yes, sir. I thank you for your presentation. I have one question. Um, how do entrepreneurs um, retain a strong culture in organization? With difficulty. <laughs> I mean, there is no doubt that the bigger you get, the, the dumber you get. The bigger you get, the dumber you get. Because as you get, but, but when we had five places or 10 places or 20 places or 50 places, if we made a wee mistake, if it did something wrong, the, uh, it didn't have a too dramatic an effect. But when we were in a business doing a billion pounds turnover, 1% was a big difference. The, uh, and of course, what happened was you brought into the organizations all sorts of what, systems and procedures to try and find out these errors. And often what happened was it turned into bureaucracy, a form of bureaucracy. And what it did was it took people who were entrepreneurial, and we wanted all of our people to be entrepreneurial. But the systems and procedures we put into place often, at the end of the day, handcuffed our people. And what became important was uh, making sure that you adopted and you, you, you followed in on with the procedure that was set down. And that was the hardest job, was to make sure, at the end of the day, bureaucracy didn't kill the business. They, uh, now, as far as trying to make sure the message went out, we used all the methods that one could possibly do, communications. And we spent a lot of time in communicating with our people. But the best communication in the lot was to train our people from the beginning. The uh, regular training programs gave us the opportunity. And rooms like this was to bring people together, train them about the organization, and really explain to them what was coming. What we also had great difficulty was operating in 18 different countries. And 80% of the business was in eight different countries. The operating in France was totally different from operating in the UK. The different culture, we had to learn that. We, and it cost us a lot of money. It would take me too long to tell you the story of the failures that we had in France till we got it right. But one of the things we learned was if you want to be successful in an organization, make sure the, organ the management responsible for that organization are from the country in which you're actually operating. They, uh, they've got to get support, they've got to get backup from the central office in Edinburgh or Scotland as it was. But the people who are responsible for leading and developing that organization, if it was in France, had to be Frenchmen. If it was in Germany, it had to be German. If it was in Thailand, it had to be Thais. If it was in South Africa, it had to be South Africans because they knew exactly what it was all about and built a relationship with them. It wasn't easy. Communications, we tried all sorts of things, communication. I remember 1981. In 1981, we made, we made vast expansion. We went from 50 centres by two major acquisitions. We went from 50 centres to 102 centres the, with the first organisation. And the next day, uh, company that we bought, nine months later, we went from 102 organized places to 240. And we suffered unbelievably. We expanded quicker than we were capable of doing. We were, we were great operators. We knew how to run a business. 
knew how to develop the business, but we didn't know how to manage a business of that size. And we didn't have the qualifications of it. And I had to go out and embroil people and bring people in that had the talent. And I remembered that in the first shop that I talked about in Buclue Street, when I needed people, I went out and brought people in that I already had a relationship with. So I couldn't have the time. So I went to people who dealt with us. I went to the sales director of Michelin. And I said, David Jenkins, come and join us. Be our managing director. Be responsible for putting these three companies together. I went to Arthur Anderson, the senior partner in Scotland, Duncan White. I said, Duncan, come and join us. He, uh, to be responsible for developing the finances, the controls that we need to do. I went to our advertising agent, Peter Holmes, and I said to him, come and join us. And I brought in a team of people that we already had relationships with. There was no learning curve. The, uh, and they helped us to overcome the difficulties that we had. But in those times, one of the things we had to do was by bringing together three workforces they have many thousands of people, but to communicate, give them the message. And we came up with the idea in 1980 that we'd send them all videotapes with a message from the chief executive. And that was me. The, uh, and I sent, we, we created all these thousands of videotapes and we sent them out and we said, we'd like you to watch this on the first Monday of next month. Or first Sunday, actually, of next month. Seven o'clock at night, sit down with your family and get the story of Quickfoot. Well, in my house, right, the, uh, I said to Anne, seven o'clock tonight, we're watching this video. So I plugged it on and it opened. Can't get better than a quick bit better. You can't get better. And it came and there's a guy dressed with a blue suit, a light tie and a blue shirt, sitting on the edge of a desk saying, good evening. I am so pleased to come here tonight into your living room, in your lounge, into your house and tell you about your company. And Anne said to me, how long does this last? <laughs> I said, about 15 minutes. She says, give me a shout when it's finished. We learned to do it better than, there was better ways of doing things. But you have to work at it to try and make sure you keep your culture. It's, it's not easy. So Tom, I don't wish to hold you back from the Russian That's all right. Your, your focus on um, <clears throat> developing people is, and always has been, very impressive. Is it still true that you can't, that can't get better than a quick fit fitter? <laughs> I sincerely hope so. <laughs> it's all my life, right? And I'd like to think the legacy that we when we left the organisation, still fills it. And it's surprising how many times I get letters from customers that say, just to let you know, and I got one just recently from a man called Neville Johnson. You maybe see him advertising in the uh, Sunday magazines. He sells fitted furniture and all that. He said, dear Tom, just to let you know, I went to the, the Quick Fit Centre in Altingham, and these boys say quite simply, they miss you. But one thing was still there, was the service was as good as the day that you left. I thought it was rather nice. And I like to think at the end of the day that the organisation still had a lot of what it was that we were there. I think we've yes, got, we got time for one more because I know Sir Tom's on a tight oh, schedule. Right. Uh, Sir Tom, um, we, you're talking about the, the people you employ. Um, we, we're at the stage of looking for further investment. Now, I'm not going to tap you tonight for any investment, but it's, we're talking about the, the, the um, relationships you have with people and what's become very apparent now is a relationship we will potentially be building with a potential investor. Um, we thought that we would, it would have to be an angel syndicate that would cut, we would need to, to get the money that we're looking for. We've been very fortunate that, that the, the product we have is attracting a lot of attention. But what we're feeling now is the syndicates are putting um, restrictions on us even before we start and uh, whether that's a guidance of an indication of what's going to happen if they actually give us the money. I would prefer to go back to one or two individuals instead and, and build a good relationship with them so when the good times and the bad times they'll understand why we're doing it rather than being controlled by an anonymous group of syndicate, angel syndicates. Just wondered what your thoughts were. It's a tough decision, they, uh, and it is a tough decision. And you've got to realise quite simply that these people are there to back organisations, to give every support they possibly can, but they've also got the responsibility to the people who have invested with them, and they've got to make sure they give them a return. And I would say quite simply to you, that if you find the right business angel, you strike up the right relationship with them, they, uh, at the end of the day, they will not have the difficulty you're just stressing. And maybe you should just question, maybe, are they asking the right questions? Are they asking questions maybe about your organisation that you haven't asked yourself? 
And you think that you could end up developing a relationship with them, which actually helps to improve your business in every way. We, were a public, we, went, we became a public company and our shares in the stock exchange. And people used to say to me quite simply, would you prefer to be private? Or would you prefer, are you quite happy being public? Well, I'll tell you, being public and being answerable to shareholders and institutions was a pain in the butt. There's nothing like being private, right? We have private businesses now. We're not answerable to anything. But we would never have grown without the support of these people. And it was amazing that so often, right, when they made points to us and made things, they were right. And it helped to make us, perhaps this word, corporate governance, just pay more attention to the things that we should pay attention to. The, uh, so don't just knock it. Don't just walk away from it. The, uh, make sure at the end of the day the people you do uh, allow to invest in your company. And once you do that, it's no longer your company, it's our company. And there's a big change to that. But make sure that the people that you do, that you strike up that relationship with and that there is a feeling of trust both ways. And if things are right, tell them and boast about it being right. And if things are wrong, don't hesitate to tell them because at the end of the day, they want to do whatever they can to help you to succeed. So just look at it very carefully. Yes, sir. Um, just one simple question. For, a simple um, for, young, well, for a young growing company, what are the qualities that you should look for for senior management? when you get to that point, that were useful for you back in the day? People with energy. Energy, you know, now you, as I said earlier, that can-do attitude. They, uh, and not a rash can-do, we can do everything, we can rule the world. I don't mean that. But people with self-confidence, at the end of the day, that they believe that with effort and hard work that they would get there. They, uh, and we needed that. And we needed that when we did that big expansion program. They, uh, and we had what we called, we went into a period of profit sabbatical. The, uh, the profits just dropped with a wee holiday for a while. The, uh, but everyone that we brought into was high energetic people. The, uh, and these people, their energy and their enthusiasm spilled out in the organization and it was infectious and they kept it going, the, uh, et cetera. So I'd say more than anything else, they look for people with energy. But that's true of the young people that we employed as well. The, uh, of course, you're looking for people with academic qualifications, etc. But when you had two people with similar academic qualifications, the one who won through was the one who came through with a can-do attitude, because this is what you wanted in the organisation. Ladies and gentlemen, I said business is all about people. Life's all about people. Everything's about people. Computers, etc., etc. They can never work without people. The uh, people makes things exciting. Can I just say thanks very much for listening to me tonight? Really great pleasure to give me the opportunity to tell the story. And I stress it again, if it comes over that I believe that everything was right, it wasn't. We made a lot of mistakes, but never be frightened of mistakes. Just be frightened of the fact that you're not paying enough attention to look for the mistakes that happen and do something about them very, very quickly. So once again, good luck and good health. Thank you. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.